people themselves are dynamic. People can take different roles or get promoted or change locations, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those have an impact on our headcount costs over time. So by aligning on principles, we empower our teams with that, again, that mental algorithm to make decisions that are all kind of aligned. We're the Headcount People. Our podcast talks about all things headcount management, and our guests are the masters. If you're in charge of planning, managing, or reporting on headcount and headcount spend, we'll help you crack the code on this delicate dance by giving you strategies and tools from the masters themselves. Make sure to subscribe and follow for every new episode right when it drops. Here's your host, Bashar Makija. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Headcount People. I just want to remind everybody, this is our second season. And today, as my guest, I have a very dear friend, Josh Rappaport. Uh, Josh, you're joining us from Seattle today? I am. I'm in uh, Seattle, and it's a rare, sunny day in the fall in Seattle today. Amazing. Amazing. So uh, I think for all our listeners, I just want to get everybody excited that today, Josh is going to talk to us about his journey in the finance function, starting at Microsoft, seeing Microsoft scale. I I call it the place where people learn all the good processes. (laughs) Then he went to Bilgo, again, was there at 50 employees till 300, double digit or triple digit growth in revenue. He'll share that with you. And now he is the VP of FP&A at uh, Acumatica, which is a 600-person company, again, triple-digit million ARR. Um, so I, I think I'm just super excited to see someone sharing their information and knowledge through the lens of a long-spanning career across large organization, fast-growing startups, and now an upstart mid-sized company. So welcome, Josh. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Awesome, Josh. Let's, let's do this. Why don't we start with a quick introduction in your words? And I I would love if you can highlight for our listeners the journey that you have taken. And if there are some anecdotes like, hey, this is what I loved about Microsoft. This Mm -hmm. is what I loved about Bilgo. And and like, and how it is shaping your, you've just joined Acumatica, how it is shaping your journey here, that that would be great for us. Uh, Of course. And and the first thing I want to share is that my journey, I think a lot like many others is not, a, was not a straight line. I think there's a tendency, especially for finance professionals to want to plan. And what I learned really early on, maybe I'm still learning today, is that the more I tried to plan, the more I tried to control my career, the less <laughs> things went to plan and the less things went as, as I expected them to. In fact, my, my boss right now, our CFO, as we're talking about our three, four, five-year plan, he likes to remind all of us, including our CEO and our investors, that the only thing certain about the plan is that it'll be wrong. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think it's a, it's a good parallel for, for the way I approached my career. I actually started my career a really long time ago in the late 90s as an investor doing private equity and, and eventually early stage venture investing. And realized after several years of that, that in order to be the best investor I could be, I I needed operational experience. And so when I eventually went back to business school, the idea was to go to school and come out of school and and go to work for a great company, learn what it means to run a company, to grow a company, and then go back to being an investor. But as as apparently all my plans do, that that failed. Um, it kind of failed terrifically. And and I realized I really liked running and growing businesses and being an operator. And, and so I never went back to that venture world. That maybe maybe in my second or third or fourth career down the line, maybe, maybe I'll go back. But you mentioned I, I started my operating career, let's say, in, in large mm-hmm. companies. I, in fact, right after business school, I worked at Yahoo for a number of years, and then I got the uh, proverbial offer you couldn't refuse to move up to Seattle and, and work for Microsoft. And Microsoft for me was an incredible training ground. Sure, I, I'm an undergrad from a great school and I'm an MBA from a great school, but Microsoft was like getting my PhD. And the 
incredible luxury that Microsoft has in being a couple hundred thousand person company and trillions of dollars of, of value value is that they have the, the, the privilege of being able to be highly, highly focused and specialized. Virtually everybody you work with is an expert in their particular function and not only their function, but their sub, sub, sub function. And so when I think about my time at Microsoft, I especially think about a handful of conversations I had with Amy Hood, who's, who's just an amazing, incredible CFO and an amazing, incredible person, human being. And one of the things that, that she would say that really, in fact, inspired one of my leadership principles, she would say, I've, I don't know, it was probably three, four, 5,000 finance employees. And as a company, we're making tens of thousands of decisions, probably more than that a day. How her, her challenge was, how, can, how could she ensure that the decisions that this huge organization were making every day were aligned with how she would make decisions? Because clearly she couldn't make them all. She would be a bottleneck. Right. And so she talked about kind of having a mental algorithm for how we make decisions, for making decisions at scale, which... which really influence the way I think about a lot of, of leadership. So one of my leadership principles is focus first on principle so that aligned outcomes will follow. And what I mean by that is if we talk about how we think about problems, what our first principles are, what, what, are, our, what are the things that are meaningful to us as individuals and as a business? What are we trying mm-hmm. to achieve? And we have a framework for what those principles are. That framework itself becomes that decision-making algorithm. So we're focused left on, oh, do, should Mary get three more headcount? Should Bob get six more? Do we need to move this function from this location to that location? Uh, we're, we're thinking less about those distinct decisions and more about how do these fit our principles. Maybe we have a, a strategic focus on building new product functionality and, and, and that principle now determines whether or not Mary gets three heads or Bob gets two, or maybe we have a principle around moving to lower cost locations, for example, that, that kind of principle that we're aligned on helps anybody in my organization make a decision on a, a specific question or, or, or specific ask that we know reasonably will be aligned with what I would think or what my, my boss or CFO would think or what John or CEO would think, et cetera. And so kind of that early time that I spent at Microsoft amongst other really impactful learnings, one of them was really about how do you learn to make decisions at scale? How do you empower your organization, not just yourself, to make decisions that are all aligned as well? And so that, that's just one one yeah. bit of, of the PhD I, I think I earned. Yeah. So let me let me actually ask you the how did you adapt these operating principles? You went from a very, very large organization with hundreds of thousands of employees, trillions of dollars in value to a startup, which you yep. joined Bilgo around 50 employees, right? Yep. Can you <laughs> can you help us understand like how did you narrow your focus or try to cram all that knowledge and principles into a smaller organization? Yeah, kind of that, the journey is interesting. And, and, and I thank you for bringing me back to my career journey. Because I think one important thing, I just want to wrap up Microsoft really quickly as it relates to Bilgo. Mm-hmm. One important thing at Microsoft, aside from being able to learn from incredible people, was the opportunity to really engage in, in actually different roles and different functions. So I so what's interesting for me is, or about me, hopefully, is that I didn't spend my whole nine, almost nine years at Microsoft in finance roles. Uh, I did the first four-ish in finance roles. And then because of my focus on business partnership, because of my focus mm-hmm. on answering the questions of why, I was asked by one of, one of my very senior business partners to come work with him and join his organization First in strategy roles, and then a chief of staff roles, and then eventually in product roles, et cetera. And so I have this broad experience, not just in finance, but also a little bit in marketing, a bunch in product, a bunch in just strategy and overall business operations that I was able to bring to bear 
at Bilgo, which is a much, much smaller company where you can imagine that you don't have the privilege of specialization and focus, mm-hmm. where really the finance person could really could also be the marketing person and also the, the operations person and also the chief admin. And, and so I think kind of while yes, it was a huge transition from a company like Microsoft to Bilgo, it was also a great opportunity to leverage this breadth of experience that I had. Now I will tell you, like there were there were definitely like moments early on where I go, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like, okay, where's our data? They're like, what data? What are you talking about? <laughs> or yeah, because Microsoft in particular is a very data-driven organization. They they democratize data, everybody has access to it, everybody is expected to be able to use it, understand it, and analyze it. And I get to Belgo and I'm like, okay, well, where's our where's our performance data? How do we know how the the application is working? Or it's a it was a fintech company, a payments company. So like, what are our payment success rates and et cetera? And like people are like, there, yeah, there's no system to get the data. There are no reports. Like you just need to figure it out. Like pull it out of the production system. Like get some engineers to help you. So so there, there's a little bit of like, oh my God, what did I do? Because there was just not a lot of maturity and not a lot of structure. But what ironically trained me for that was a company with a ton of maturity and a ton of structure, whereby I had lots of exposure to, to broad functional responsibilities and capabilities where I could just come in and, and say, going back to the why, I realized that it was just up to me to solve things. Like nobody was going to give me the answers. I had to ask the questions and, and, and find out the answers myself. Can you, while we are on this topic, there is always this question that comes to people that there is, I mean, I think there is endless opportunity in a company like Microsoft, Google. Like I think, right, if we can see it in real time in Satya Nadella's reign, the, the mm-hmm. companies reorienting and breaking new grounds and doing something that even startups can't achieve at the mm-hmm. nimble, fast rate. But what was that motivation for you to go from such a large organization to a, such a small organization? Like, what were you thinking? Why did you make this decision? Yeah. Maybe maybe that's one of the guiding principles for younger folk who may sure. be already at Microsoft, but now are getting opportunities to work at startups. Yeah, sure. Again, going back to, I think the first thing I said is none of it was planned. I, I like to talk about my career as being one of fortuitous serendipity. So frankly, being in the right place at the right time, but also being prepared to seize on the opportunities that are that are right in front of you. And so... Yeah. It was a combination of things. Like, honestly, like I had spent almost nine years at Microsoft. And, and so that wow. times feels like an, e- like an eternity. Like it's, it's Microsoft years, maybe for me, were like dog years. So like I, I felt as though I'd been there a long time. Now, obviously, lots of things had changed and it was, it was, it was pretty exciting throughout. But there's definitely a sense of like, wow, I've been here a while. What is it, it, it kind of, it, it's that grass is, is always greener. Like it was kind of curious, what, what does it look like on the outside? And in, and in fact, like I actually wasn't thinking about going back into finance either at that point, because I was doing product work in, in, in the Dynamics 365 org and ERP software where, where I am now at Acumatica, but I, I wasn't planning on going back to finance and, and what they proposed was, hey, we don't have a finance. We're a fintech company. We don't have a finance org. We have a hmm. person who has has been managing all the books and managing all the treasury operations and managing all the money move and whatnot. And in order for us to scale, we really need to scale our capabilities. Given your background, the highest leverage role, the, the most value that you could probably bring to our company is, is to help us build a finance organization and finance capabilities. And it was everything from planning to controllership to treasury operations, et cetera. And and, uh, again, for me, like I knew, like, let me be super clear. I knew I was not at all qualified to do this, right? In fact, I I don't tell anybody that I work for, but I'm probably, I've never been qualified to do any role I've ever been hired for, but those are exactly the roles I want because Again, I want to be able to grow. I want to learn. And I'm just delusional enough to feel confident that I can figure everything out. And so when I went from Microsoft to Bilgo, was, yes, there's a little bit of is, a, is the grass greener. But then it was really just 
who are the people I'm going to have an opportunity to, to work with, to learn from, to grow with, to collaborate with, which I, I think, especially early in, in career, folks don't put enough emphasis on that, don't value that highly enough. The people that you're working with are going to make the biggest difference in your career much more significantly than the name on your resume. Um, that's, that's a very important point. Yeah. Right? And, and yeah. so kind of when, when I went to Bilgo, it was like great leadership. In fact, the C-suite had, I think at some at one point, like something like five former CEOs. So there's a great deal of experience that, that I knew that I could I could gain insight from. And then it was just this challenge of like, hey, you're going to go from 5,000 person finance orgs to org of one. And you, but, but that was exciting for me because I knew I was going to get to build something. Because even as a finance person, I like I like to create, I like to build. And so I was like, okay, well, what I can build here, maybe it's not a product, but it's a function, it's a capability, it's an understanding. And so that was really what was most interesting to me about Bilgo. And, and then it, it, it bore out, like it, it, it turned out really nicely. So I joined when it was about 50 people, about six or $7 million in revenue at the time. And by the time I left two and a half years later, we were close to 300 people, 60, 70 million, almost 10x growth. And that was, that experience taught me so much in two and a half years. Maybe it was my second PhD, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think a, a nice way to come into now your role at Acumatica, you have a CFO, you went from 5,000 people in finance to a team of one, build everything now. It's again a 500, 600 person company, a mature business, but you are building now a function within finance. So more specialization. So you went from very, very, you went from jack of all trades to the leader of an org. Now you are becoming more specialized. Yeah. Tell us about how you first joined Acumatica. Tell us about Acumatica. Sure. Um, And then I would love if you can, as part of this segment, before we move on to the next segment, tie it all together in a way is that this is everything that I'm bringing, my two PhDs. I'm bringing this to Acumatica. Mm-hmm. What do you expect from this role? Right? I mean, I mean, I think you're running out of topics to do your PhD in. You never, like, maybe, maybe I'll just be a, a student forever. I hope I'm a student forever, actually. Let me, let me put it that way. You asked me a question prior prior to recording the episode here and it, you asked me a little bit about the focus of finance and, and high growth companies and, and, yeah. and there's been a pendulum swing recently we went from maybe 12 18 months ago where or actually maybe prior to 12 18 months 18 months ago where it was grow at all costs Absolutely. and then over the last 12 18 months has been profitable growth or, or i'm sorry just focus on profitability. And now we're kind of that, the pendulum is moderating a little bit and, and, and we're focusing on profitable growth. Similarly, my career's pendulum. So I started massive, massive, huge company, swing the pendulum to a, a much smaller, super, super high growth company. And now kind of moderating a little bit. I think I referred to Acumatica as Ac- uh, referred to Acumatica to you earlier as like my Goldilocks, not too big, mm. not too small, not too hot, not too cold. Acumatica is a 600 person company. We do triple digit millions of dollars in revenue, privately held, growing very, very quickly, double digit growth, top line and, and, driving significant profitability. I have to think about what I can share, but driving pretty significant profitability. And and so we're we're certainly not Microsoft and Google, but we're definitely grown and developed well beyond early stage startup. And and I think for me it was A, an opportunity to experience a different stage of development. But really it was and, and so far has proven out to be kind of a best of both worlds scenario where we have some foundation, some structure, some stability that you would see in a larger company, but mm-hmm. also still so much market opportunity, so much product opportunity, and so much organizational opportunity that I still get to focus on growing and building. And so that was, that was certainly interesting. 
Um, going back to prior statement around the people that you work with being so important, what, what struck me and really what sold me on Acumatica were the conversations that I had with our senior leadership, in particular, our CFO and our CEO, both of whom bring decades of, of experience in, in growing software and technology companies and just a level of executive maturity and thoughtfulness and transparency that I found really important that I knew also from a personality standpoint, interpersonal standpoint, I was going to be able to work really well with the team. And so that, that was obviously a huge, huge influence on my decision to join Acumatica. And then I was asked, it's funny, I was asked point blank, why would you want to come to Acumatica and lead FP&A when you led full finance organizations before? And the answer is twofold. One is because there's always more to learn. And again, like I think I can learn a lot from our CFO and our CEO, but really FP&A is kind of where I came from. I think a lot of people come to finance leadership from different paths. You, you get CFOs who come from investment banking, you have CFOs who come from the accounting and controllership side, you have CFOs who come from FP&A. I, I have always had my grounding in FP&A and strategic finance and business partnering. And so here was an opportunity to help transition a finance organization from being somewhat inwardly focused which maybe I have pejoratively referred to at other companies as finance for the sake of finance, to kind of building this business partnering mentality and outward focus towards a finance organization, building the capability and mindset to be problem solvers and influencers of decision and influencers of business outcomes. And so even though the scope Technically, at Acumatica for me is probably narrower than other scopes that I've had in the past. It was, I, I think the opportunity is even more impactful because I have this foundation upon which I can stand and still this opportunity to kind of build new perspective and new capabilities. And so that, that's, that's really, that was my thinking. I've, I've now been in role for two months, two months and four days, exactly. And, and so far, so good. And, and I was kind of going through my first planning cycle and my first quarterly business cycle and still very much in that, that learning phase, that consumption phase where I keep promising my boss that I'll be productive at some point. <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let's try and get a little tactical because I think the next few questions will shape a lot of your answers will shape the conversation right. uh, to a great detail is like, just walk us through the current Team, team size. Mm -hmm. uh, were you the first FPNA hire? Did you have analysts? Sure. Uh, and then, what is your tech stack? Yep. So let's let's start there, and then I, I want to ask you about your uh, how you are becoming the business partner, or how you are channeling mm -hmm. the company to, the, to be more outward finance, and what what do you think you can achieve in the first hundred days? But let's talk about the tactical stuff first. Sure. Okay. So. The finance org, the full finance org, the CFO org, finance and accounting, it's about 25 people or so, round number. Mm -hmm. The FP&A team is, is, depending on exactly how you define it, between seven and 10 people. Okay. So there, there is a team in place. Um, the team is largely earlier in career. Okay. And so a lot of, again, a lot of focus on reporting and providing information. And so the idea when our CFO was hired eight months ago now, the idea was he wanted to bring in somebody like me to lean in and lead the FPNA org to help kind of a relatively early in career organization kind of learn how to business partner, how to gain trust and credibility with senior leaders, how to develop instinct into what questions to ask and frankly, what questions to answer, how to think beyond, well, here are the numbers in a spreadsheet to what do these numbers mean? And, and so we're, and like I said, I'm two months into that journey. So we're relatively early into that journey. But, but what I'm noticing, especially amongst the team is a, a incredibly high degree of engagement. I'll have conversations with folks on my team. They're like, oh, we're like, 
nobody's ever pushed me to think this way before. Or I didn't realize it was my role to answer questions. I thought I was just supposed to deliver reports, et cetera. And, and so, and while that's potentially challenging, um, I think that everybody's taking the perspective of, of like, yeah, this is really what we want to be doing. And so this is great. And, and people see me not as, as creating risk for them, but, but rather creating opportunity for them. And, and, and I very much appreciate that too, because I've realized I, so I have an executive coach and, and um, I've been working with him for several years now. And, and I think last time I, I spoke to him, maybe about a month ago, I said, I said, Steve, I, I realized something. I realized that I'm actually not particularly great at finance, but I think where I have my, where my real strength lies is in leading and helping to develop people. And, and what's interesting is like, I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was like, I, I, I can create any spreadsheet you can think of. I can model anything that you want. I can help explain business outcomes, but I never really thought of myself as a leader of people and, and as somebody to ha- that could help people learn and develop their own careers. Whereas today, I think that's probably more my strength than like the technical financial capabilities. Um, okay. And, and so that, that's kind of a really interesting spot to be in. So lots to unpack there, but Acumatica <laughs> itself is a CRM and ERP. So uh, you, you, you got to eat your own dog food. Yep. Now, what are some of the other tools that uh, you're using today? Yeah. yeah, so Acumatica, as you mentioned, ERP, cloud-based ERP, primarily for mid-market companies in manufacturing, construction, distribution, a bit of retail. Noticeably, I didn't, I didn't say software. <laughs> so kind of an, an, an interesting situation where we're a software company using our own product that wasn't really defi- designed for our business. Um, you know, obviously we know how to use it really, really well. So I feel we've, we've got a really strong backbone in, in the core ERP and CRM. One of the things that we're doing right now aligned with our focus on fp and business partnering and forward-looking planning is we're implementing an fp tool, which I'm sure I know you're familiar with. I'm sure many of mm-hmm. your viewers are familiar with. We're implementing Planful to help with our both our fp reporting and insights generation, but also very much with our, our scenario planning capabilities so that we're not relying upon. I love, I love Microsoft Excel. That's not just because I worked at Microsoft. I like, I love it, but Planful is going to be really, really instrumental in our ability to do dynamic scenario planning and, and forecasting. So implementing Planful with our FP&A tool, I think that's going to be a significant key to unlock value. And then beyond that, systems that you would think about. So we use UKG for HRIF and headcount system of record one of the things that's that even with Planful and UKG and the Acumatic ERP, one of the things that is incredibly relevant for our conversation, one of the things that'll be that will continue to be a challenge is, is headcount planning. I mean, we're a software company, so I don't know the, the precise number, but let's just say the lion's share of our expenses are, are headcount. And I think one of the challenges that I see with solutions in the market today is everybody thinks about headcount and headcount expense as a, a snapshot or a single point in time. Hmm. And I, I've said this to you prior, like head count and people expenses are really, it's, it's a flow, the flow of expenses. It's not a one time I'm just, I need to pay for this thing, a hundred dollars and then I have it. It's right. I'm hiring somebody and now like someone in perpetuity, I have to continue to pay them. But timing really matters. Bow wave matters, or when you hire somebody in a year, and what the impact is not just on this year's budget, but on next year's and forthcoming years. Um, the way people themselves are dynamic. So within an organization, people can take different roles or get promoted or change locations, et cetera, et cetera. And, and all of those have an impact on our headcount costs over time. And one of the things that I yeah, I feel like I've been talking to you about Team Ohana for years now. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, and and it has been it's just been an incredible ride to watch, <laughs> right? One of the things that that I think Team Ohana does really well is think of is help people understand 
the flows and the dynamic scenarios of different headcount changes and moves and decisions that we're making. Whereas most of the kind of legacy tools really is just like, well, here's the number today. And right. as a result, like we, we still live and we probably will live for the foreseeable future in lots and lots and lots of spreadsheets. But given, given the magnitude of, of call the, the percentage of costs that, that are headcount for us, this is definitely an area that I can imagine that we'll, we'll be investing in over the next 12 to 18 months. As soon as we get kind of our fp tool stood up and, and also just some of the organizational development pieces for, for the fp a or in place. Because to be fair, even if you have the best tool sets, if you don't, if the organization isn't, doesn't have the exact right mindset or isn't oriented or built the right way to take advantage of that tool sets, they're not going to be terrifically useful. So Absolutely. I'm moving yeah. both of these things in parallel, right? So let's uh, you you mentioned something about an FPNA software which is planful that is going to enable largely your team of ten people to be able to do more, yep. do more act, like be more productive, more accurate, and more also most likely real time. But there is this whole piece about business partnership is to actually partner with the mm-hmm. business. Yes, right? can you talk about where are the, and you can take a broad lens viewpoint from just general opportunities where FPNA can partner with business leaders directly and not just the department owners, but also HR and talent, right? Because the answering the why around, if we just focus on headcount for a minute, is you are, finance comes up with a budget, the budget needs to be translated into a plan, mm. which is a combination of activities between probably HR, business leaders. Then it has to be mapped to, can we deliver on this plan from a recruiter capacity standpoint? And then it, I mean, it's it's a constant, it's not just a flow, but it is also a cycle that you have to keep updating and keep evaluating. So h- how do you think about these things about partnership so that you enable these business functions and help them get more productive, help them help the business grow at the pace that you want to grow. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of this is, is, is self, it's a self-reinforcing cycle. So when we were just talking about what's the tech stack and, and what tools are we using, firstly, I should say at a high level, I, I want my tech stack to alleviate as much manual transactional work as possible for my finance team. I, 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 I want my finance team to not be the mechanics, so to speak. I want them to be the engineers. I don't want them like turning nuts and bolts or pressing buttons and pulling levers. I want them asking why, again, going back to channeling mm-hmm. their three or five-year-old, and being able to kind of channel that understanding and building trust and and kind of interactive trust with their business partner. So let me let me unpack what that means for me because that was just a lot of words, honestly. And when I think about my career, to a large extent, I talked about kind of the breadth of my functional experience as, as maybe being interesting because I've done lots of things. But where it's really interesting, where that that has added a ton of value to my finance roles is because I've, I've done other things. I've, I've been in the seat of a marketer. I've been in the seat of a product manager. I've been the chief of staff of an 1,100-person engineering organization. I now have both empathy and understanding for the types of challenges, questions, and, and activities that my business partners are experiencing on a day-to-day basis. And so... I can bond with them and create a great deal of trust. And also I can, I have at least some insight into what's their challenge, what can I help them solve? And so I, I'm not suggesting that everybody can or should follow the path that I followed and go do some marketing, go do some product and go do some cheap. But what, what I am suggesting is that as finance people, Once we get the core technical capabilities of finance and accounting and understanding gap and knowing what a P&L is and and the like, 
one of the things that I think is undervalued still today is really an understanding your business partner's role in a business. And so when I talk to my team in particular, or my teams historically, I talk about finance with having, we, we sit in this privileged perch. Those are the terms I use. We basically, we're able to sit in the middle of the business and see everything that's happening around us. I can see what marketing's doing and sales and product and engineering and HR and operations. And we get we have this privileged view of everything that's happened. But privilege doesn't come without a, a price, right? So like the price of that privilege is that we both have the capability and the responsibility to help translate what each of our partner organizations and functions and leaders are, are doing from their language to what I kind of call the universal language of business, which is finance, which is numbers, right? So be able to translate what marketing is doing into financial outcomes, but also not just functional language into finance or business language. Also, we have the responsibility of helping our, our functional partners, our business partners translate amongst themselves, like truly being the Rosetta Stone, the universal translator. So if, if my finance team understands marketing and understands product and understands engineering, we can help them understand each other as well. It doesn't have to just be a functional language to finance and back. It can be a functional language through finance to another functional language, so to speak. In a similar way, like we also play this translation role for HR. So I can, because I understand either what the budgets are, the plans are for each of our functional organizations, and I can understand it holistically, I can also help translate that for HR in their language. As maybe the engineer speaking a different language than, than your recruiter is. But since I sit in the middle and I need to understand it all, I can help them under I can help them understand each other, help them communicate better with each other, help them plan better with each other, collaborate better with each other, and, and effectively drive better business outcomes because I've spent the time, my team has spent the time understanding our business partners. It's really about understanding, it's about trust, it's about empathy. Finance today is so much less about the technical capabilities. Hmm. The, the modeling, the spreadsheets, of course, it's important, right? The data analysis, that's all incredibly important. But like the difference between good and great is understanding, storytelling, narrative, being able to kind of proactively intuit what questions are going to be asked and proactively answering those questions it's about supporting decision making fundamentally and and having this innate understanding of what information is going to be imperative to, for somebody to be able to make a decision for your business partners to make a decision and communicating and telling and, and sharing that information in a narrative that that's easy to understand so i mean the extending that point to and trying to get a little more, I would say, narrow in, in defining some goals. What I, what I want to hear is that being a strategic partner, being proactive, right? That is, you, I think that is fundamentally what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Of course, having empathy, understanding the business. But you, you cannot, you've also said that you should not be reporting the news, but you should be predicting the weather. That's what, in a way... Yeah. Yeah, you, your, your way of saying that was much more succinct than mine. <laughs> so how are you, what is the outcomes that you are looking for in the first 100 days? Mm -hmm. And I know 100 days in the grand scheme of things is not a big number, but it's also not an insignificant amount of time. What, so in your first 100 days, with the with the principles that you just spoke about, what do you want to achieve, or what do you think you should be achieving? Yep. So I'm two thirds of the way through my first hundred days. So maybe this is unfair. Maybe I'm going to just give you the answer that makes me feel better about what I've done <laughs> in the last sixty some. But but 
I, I'll continue to go back to like my focus is on learning and understanding. It's on curiosity. And so just as a human being. So for me, the first hundred days are probably if there, if there are five things, the first three are learn, get to know your team, you know, get to know your team, get to know your team, get to know your team for, for a number of reasons. One, I do have the privilege of, of having a team that that's there, that's in seat. So there's some foundation. So my team has the institutional knowledge, has the background that's going to help me get up to speed faster. So that, that's one reason to get to know your team. Two is these are the folks that, that you're going to be working really, really, really closely with. And just as we want to drive empathy and, and understanding and comfort and collaboration with our business partners, even more so think about that, you know, exponentially more important for your own team. So I, I, I want to understand who's on my team, what are their strengths, what are they good at, what do they like to do, what are their opportunities for growth, what, what do they want to be when they grow up, how can I provide them opportunities to get exposure, but also what can I learn from them? And then also, like, there's just, like, the relationship matters. Again, we're all people. So I, I talked about choosing companies because of the leaders and, and the individuals involved. And I think we've all heard it said, like, people, people leave companies because of their managers, not because of the company. And so I, I want to develop personal relationships because I just think it's important. It, it's, it's important to me, but I think it's important for them as well to be able to know who I am. Trust me, know that I have a wife and a seven-year-old son and two cats who are, you know, I locked them out of the office right now because otherwise they would have come and shared all their points of view on headcount management with you. They love Zoom call. Like I want people to, to know who I am as a human being. So I, I think that that engenders a lot more trust. So if, if I had five recommendations, the first three are get to know your team. The second is learn the lingo. So every, I mean, I'm, I've worked for lots of companies in my life and we all generally do similar things, but we all have different acronyms for it. Even something as, as silly as like, I was just, I was just talking about how at Acumatica, we do our, our monthly reporting and, and instead of calling it a BVA budget versus actuals, we call it an AVB, actuals versus budget. But it's, it, it, it's something really small, but like learning the acronyms, learning the proxies, <clears throat> the different reports, the teams, the structure of how the company operate, literally learning the names of people, but just learning the lingo. And, and really closely tied to that is also learn the metrics. So we're, we're, we're in SaaS, you and I are both in the SaaS world. And right. we talk about there seemingly some standard SaaS metrics, ARR, NRR, magic number, CAC, and LTV. But the precise definitions of them are different depending on what, who's defining them. So even if you look at, like, I, I forget who put it out, maybe it was one of the investment bank, like, you look at a number of public SaaS companies, they all define AOR a little bit differently. And so understand your own metrics. How do we define our metrics? What do they mean? Because it'll, it'll, it'll help you, it helped me at least, understand how our business is performing. And frankly, how you define the metrics really tells you a lot about what's important in the business. So, so, so that one, two, three, or get to know your team. Set four is learn the lingo. And then five is actually, is, is perhaps is antithetical, but don't do too much too soon. Use, yeah. use your, like, I like to say, like, if I'm bringing somebody on to the team, I assume it's going to take about six months for them to run. So the first hundred days is like half of, of what I'm expecting for their ramp. And, and so I think there's a, often a desire, like, I need to make impact fast. Okay. And, and maybe in a startup, like, yeah, 100 days is an eternity. So you do, you have to, like, just, like, get in there and start doing stuff. But in a, a slightly mature, more mature world, 100 days is a short, really short period of time. Like, I'm just now getting through my first planning cycle, quarterly planning cycle. And so for me, it was, like, just don't break anything. Like, just observe, understand. Certainly, like, yeah, I've got my list of things that I think, A, I'm starting to understand, and B, I think kind of where I, I can make iterative improvements or changes. But I, I, I just think it would be folly to do that too soon. Because <coughs> I, 
you know, as much as, as the kind of the very first impression is, is, is really meaningful and generally pretty right, like, especially in a brand new environment when there's so much information coming at you, like it's worth, it's worthwhile to just take a beat and kind of take a minute to internalize everything before you, you, you start taking action and, and potentially changing things in, in ways that have un- unforeseen consequences. Um, so it, if I had to take a step back and synthesize that all, it's like, get to know your people, get to know your business and don't do anything. Don't break anything. That That's my first hundred days. Um, now I, I'll talk to my boss shortly this afternoon and we'll see what he, what he has to say about that. But, but that's at least how I would approach it. <laughs> You are so for folks out there who want to get into FPNA, uh, what are some of the personal KPIs they should be tracking towards? Mm-hmm. The, so it's 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 more like understanding your like what is the advice that you would give to folks, and so that is one on personal KPIs. Then I also want to know a little bit more about your, let's say you said six months to ramp. So let's talk about the next hundred days. What are the KPIs that you want to hit for your team or for your company? So personal KPIs that people should, and that's more advice driven and then business KPIs. And then we'll see how we can marry them together. Sure. Sure. I mean, I recognize that especially as finance people at all levels, like, the business outcomes and the business KPIs, are in, and hear me out on this one, they're largely outside of your control, but they are very much within your, influ- your ability to influence. There's no prescribed path to FP&A. Finance and FP&A is the lens through which we, the, again, the universal language, the universal lens through which we understand a business. You can get to fp a from an accounting background. You can get to fp a from a marketing background if you want to. You can get to fp a if you want to study finance and, and school. The, the, the real critical thing about fp a is being able to quantify activity. So if I take a step back and say, like, what, what's a financial model? Right? It's an abstraction of activity either that happened in the, in the past, if we're reporting, or that could happen in the future. So how do we quantify and understand things that are happening in real life? How do we take a business and decompose it into its, into its drivers? So I remember when I was at Yahoo pretty early on in my call it corporate finance career, and I was working on search. And I had a mentor that like sat me in, in, in a conference room with a whiteboard and said, okay, how do you think search works? We went through it. Okay, well, you have users and you have number of searches per user and you have number of clicks or number of results per search and number of clicks per results and ad revenue per click. And, the, and, and he really helped me understand how do you break down a business into its component pieces? At a super high level, like the entire world is rate times volume, which is sounds really simple, but it's really like there's some volume of things and there's some rate at which we monetize those things in in almost everything like it could be selling SaaS software it could be search like it, everything is rate times volume really but how how do you really understand your particular business quantify it, it into its drivers and then be able to understand structure around it cuz when i think about fpna and i think about strategic finance well yes it's critical to understand what does a pnl look like and what are your three financial statements? Like that, that's all table stakes to me. And maybe, maybe I'm glossing over it too much, but like that's table stakes. And you'll get that if you, if you on your own, if you want to study 10 Ks and public companies, or you come from accounting or, or, or you just ask your friendly neighborhood finance person to walk you through your company's financial statements. Like you can learn that that's pretty standard. But what's not standard and what's really kind of takes you from perhaps controllership and accounting and transactional based finance roles into more FP&A and strategic finance role is your ability to abstract real life into numbers. 
And and so like to me, it's like I always felt, especially early in my career, I might not have been all that strong on call it financial statement analysis, but I knew I was really I couldn't model anything. Because like my mind just went to like, what are all the building blocks? How do they all interrelate? How does this end up in whatever the outcome is, selling a widget or generating revenue, et cetera. And so for me, like if you want to get into finance, you want to you want to grow your career in finance and be successful, you know, understand your business partner, learn how to collaborate, learn how to storytell. But really fundamentally from a more technical standpoint is Focus on how to how to decompose your business into the core critical drivers and how they interrelate with each other. In a, a really kind of geeky way, back in my Microsoft days, I was I was working on the Bing product, and Chi Lu was the president of the Bing division. I think just being president of the Bing division, you, you, everybody should just take for granted that the guy was brilliant. But I remember being in a meeting with him. And we were talking about, I, I don't even remember what we're talking about. In that, and, and that's sort of the point. Like, it didn't really matter. His question was, he said, what's the function? And I and probably three other people in the room kind of stuck their head like, what the hell are they talking about? And then he goes up to the whiteboard and he literally drew you know, a, a mathematical function. So he's like, what's the function? What are the coefficients? How, what's the equation that we're trying to solve? And... I'm not suggesting that we break everything down into quadratic equations or something even more sophisticated mathematically than that. But this idea that there is an equation to what we're trying to do in business. And if if we can understand that equation and especially make it approachable for our business partners and our leaders and our investors and our other stakeholders, like you're going to be instrumental and so valuable that of course, yes, you're going to have a great career in finance. Wonderful. So I think we we are coming to, I'm, I'm at my final question for you. And you have spoken to me a lot about your leadership axioms, right? Or guiding principles. Yep. You also mentioned very generously, you shared that you've been working with a coach yourself for many years. And yes, these principles embody you. But I think what I'm, looking for as parting thoughts from you is that for all the other VPs of finance or VPs of fp or any business leader who has to manage people, because pe- good people strategy is good company strategy, right? Yep. Uh, and leaders play a very instrumental role in that. And I think it would just be good for everybody to all learn about how you have been going about becoming a leader and what advice would you share? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you for asking this question because it it is really meaningful to me. I'm 20, almost 30 years into my career. More than that. I don't know. A lot (laughs) of years into my career. Let's, Let's leave it at that. And I'd say for the first two thirds of my career, Honestly, and, and I look back retrospectively, it's almost a little shameful. It, it was all about me. All I cared about was me. What am I capable of doing? What, how many hours am I going to dedicate to this? What is my outcome going to be? What is my work product? And I, I think I got to a place where many people get more quickly than some more quickly than others where I realized that my success career-wise it was going to have a decreasing correlation to what I'm capable of delivering and an increasing correlation to what I can help my team deliver. And so what I, I finally realized, maybe like I finally had this like moment of wisdom or maturity or clarity, however you want to put it, I realized that the, the highest leverage thing that I could do was help my teams be as best as they can be. It was not about me. It was about the team. Um, and many people embody this like servant leadership or whatnot, but like, I'm here to support my team, not vice versa. And so that like that moment of clarity, that flipped a switch for me. And I said, okay, well, if it's not about me anymore, it's about my team and helping them be the best they can be. How do I do that? And how do I do that in a way that's, that resonates with who I am as a person and is authentic for me. And so 
Over a number of years, I've been working to try and articulate what what I call my leadership axioms or leadership principles. How do I help empower my team? And, and, and I did, I've been working with a coach for many, many years. And with his help, I've been able to articulate it into, into four principles I think are really important. The first one is like, it's always okay to say, I don't know. Like my favorite answer to any question is, I don't know. And, and that seems counterintuitive. But the reason that's my favorite question is because it invites, uh, it, it, it invites us to learn. Saying I don't know to a question is the beginning of a journey of learning, not the end. It's not, you're not admitting fault. You're saying, okay, now, now I have an opportunity to go learn something. And, and so for me, like that, that's really, really important. There, there's a side piece here too, which is like, don't ever make up an answer. Like, I'd much rather you tell me, I don't know. And let me go and try and figure it out. than make something up and have it be half-assed or wrong or, or whatever. Like there, there's just, there's nothing good comes from that. So, so embrace, I don't know. Talking about embracing, so like embrace differing points of view. That's my second leadership principle. I, I liked it maybe earlier in my career, I might have been described as being argumentative. <laughs> uh, perhaps others more kindly would say like, you should have been an attorney. Uh, but like to me, like I love debate. Like I love that intellectual jousting and exercise. Like it's just fun for me. And, and, and what I realized is that for me, like debate something to be encouraged. Uh, often we avoid debate. I, I want to encourage debate with a caveat. And, and that caveat is the debate needs to be about the idea and not about, about our individual, individual identities. It's not like, well, I don't like Bob. And so I'm going to just argue with Bob. It's about, well, I'm hearing Bob's point of view and my point of view is different. So let's try and understand the differences and it doesn't mean that we always have to, everybody has to agree, but by understanding differing points of view through debate, it actually can help us evolve our own points of view. So again, kind of this learning and growing journey, these are all related. My, my third leadership principle is like a bias towards simplicity. And I, I think a lot of people talk about simple is, simpler is better. And what I realized is like simple is really, really, really hard. But there's power in simplicity. Like if, if things are simple, they move more quickly. They produce results more effortlessly, et cetera. But because thing, simplicity is hard, it's hard to divine. It's like you really have to understand something to be able to make it simple. Like try taking something complex and explaining it to your five-year-old. If you can, if you can explain something to your five-year-old in a way that they understand it, like you really have spent the time and effort and energy to be able to to distill something complex into something very simple. And so for me, like that bias towards simplicity, what it really says is like, hey, like we all like, and maybe this ties back to my first hundred days, like we all just need to take a step back and 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 give ourselves permission to invest the time and energy to understand first. And now once we understand, now we can move really, really fast. But trying to move before you understand in the long run, in my experience, it slows things down. So I bias towards simplicity. And what that really says is like, I'm giving myself and everybody else permission to take the time to really understand something first before they jump in and try and move forward. And then the last one, and we talked about this early when I, when I mentioned Amy Hood at Microsoft, it's like focus first on principle and align outcomes will follow. Like, again, we have to make as an organization, as a business, so many decisions every single day that the CEO, the CFO, whatever, whatever leader can't make every decision, they, they become an instant bottleneck. So by aligning on principles, we, we empower our teams with that, again, that mental algorithm to make decisions that are all kind of aligned. It's that decision-making at scale, I think is the, the term that Amy used. And, and so that, that's really been a strong influence and it's really led to the, the, the final leadership principle of mine. So, yeah. <laughs> I think for the first time, I have felt that we have not just covered the basics of whether it is planning, FPNA, or finance, but we have, you in this hour long conversation, have shown the path of how to, I would say, live your life in certain ways, right? And those guiding principles, I think, 
apply to a lot of people. So I think this is, I'm, I'm very grateful that you made some time for us today. Well, thank you, Tishar. Th- I appreciate the opportunity to share. I, I hope that what we talked about sparks a little bit of curiosity in, in, in your audience. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah, thank you. 